This is the last of three videos to go along with module one of Play With Your Music. So we've identified the instruments present in the recording and graphed them on a visual sound stage to try and get a sense of how they blend together to create a cohesive mix. Lastly, we'll think about some ways we can describe and communicate about sounds and how we might describe the sounds of a recording to someone who hasn't ever heard it before. When describing music, there can be a natural tendency to proceed right to comparisons. If we were describing a new female vocalist to a friend, you might say they sound uh, something like a cross between Miley Cyrus and Sinead O'Connor. Here we're trying to draw on a contextual understanding that someone might already have of these other performers so that they can begin imagining what this new artist we're describing might sound like. This certainly transcends into sound quality and mix descriptions, both for consumers and the musicians, producers, and engineers involved in making the record. It wouldn't be irregular for a producer to ask a guitarist to give them a David Gilmore-style guitar solo, or to say, let's go for a classic ACDC drum sound. Of course, any comparison can only be an approximation and won't necessarily work if the person you're trying to communicate with doesn't understand the reference. We can learn from this how important context is to any description we're creating. So when we choose words to describe sound, we should also consider the context in which they're understood. Some words already connect to context we have from everyday life. It's safe to presume most people have an understanding of words describing location, like left, right, near, or far. But some people may have never listened to music with these dimensions in mind, so connecting their everyday understandings of dimension in the visual and tactical senses to their oral perception of music could be really ear-opening. There are other words we can use to describe the location, like forward or up front, which might mean right at the edge of that virtual sound stage, very close to your face, or seemingly originating from inside your head if you're using headphones. A word like intimate can also be used to describe something like this, and distant could certainly represent the opposite. It can also be helpful to describe the kind of environment that it sounds like the source is in. Does the pedal steel sound like it's in a small carpeted room that we might say sounds dry or doesn't have a lot of reverb? or a large concert hall that we could say sounds wet or has a lot of reverb. These terms dry and wet are commonplace in the world of recording or acoustics, but they may not have strong contextual markers for you. So let's listen to some examples to connect sound qualities to these terms. Let's start by listening to some of the lead vocal from Air Traffic, soloed in isolation. Here it is dry, recorded in a space without much natural reverb, and with no reverb or delay added. Take off your oxygen masks and your life jackets, please. They'll be on a pain if you survive the seas. Now listen to that same excerpt, but this time with the addition of a subtle amount of reverb sort of ambience. Take off your oxygen masks and your life jackets, please. They'll be on a pain if you survive the seas. Now we'll hear it with all the reverb and delay that was actually used in the final mix. Take off your oxygen masks and your life jackets, please. They'll be on a pain if you survive the sea. And now let's hear it with the rest of the mix built up around it. Take off your oxygen masks and your life jackets, please. They'll be on a pain if you survive the sea. Notice that once it's played in the context of all the other instruments and textures, it may seem a bit drier than when you listen to it soloed. All those other textures in the mix start to mask the sound of the reverb. So what may sound like a lot when something's soloed up, like we just listened to it, may be just right in the context of the mix. So that little exercise has hopefully given some context to the words dry and wet. And you can take those discussions even further by considering how long the reverb trails off or the decay time. You might describe a reverb as having a long or short decay time, or you could also describe the size and characteristics of the room that the source was recorded in. Is it in a large concert hall, the Grand Canyon, or a tiled bathroom? Another area that we need to be able to describe is timbre, or the character of the sound. 
In its broadest sense, timbre is the element of music that helps us distinguish between the sounds of different instruments, but in recording, it can apply to all the different treatments that we add to a mix. We distinguish different instruments based on the sound they generate when playing different notes. Every note has its own specific frequency, which we call the fundamental, but when the musician is playing that single note, many additional frequencies resonate along with the fundamental, and these are called harmonics or partials. An instrument or voice will likely resonate more than a dozen harmonics for each note they play or sing, with each harmonic slightly louder or softer than the others, and we can detect those very small differences. Add to those variations subtle differences in articulation, inflection, or accent, and this is how we can tell the difference between different people's voices. These are all factors that contribute to timbre. There are many tools we use when recording that can manipulate the different harmonic regions, boosting or cutting the level of frequencies across the range of human hearing. Equalizers are audio tools specific to this task that allow you to boost and cut frequencies directly, but many other tools we'll learn about in this course, compression, distortion, even different microphones or speakers, they each have a sonic character or timbre of their own. How we describe timbre can often become vague. Terms like warm, cold, dark, and bright are often used, which can be okay as long as the context is very clearly defined. In hearing, terms like warm and cold can be very subjective between different people, and that can make things confusing. A warm guitar sound to you might have no distortion, uh, reduced high frequencies, and boosted low mid-range frequencies, while a warm guitar sound to someone else could mean a gentle overdrive distortion um, and a big reverb with a long decay time. Because of this, it's sometimes easiest to talk about timbre by discussing the quality as directly as you can. Referring to something as having substantial high frequency content or being slightly overdriven are still subjective expressions, but they're addressing the specific difference in the sound's character. I know this can all start to sound a bit clinical and stuffy, but the important lesson to draw from it is that you can use any set of words to describe things, as long as the people interpreting those words have shared understandings of their meanings. I hope this breakdown of an analysis process has been helpful for you. Share yours with your learning ensemble for feedback and additional input, and keep all these ideas in mind when you listen to music. If you're listening with headphones on the subway or in your car on the way to work, try and go through some of these exercises. Pick out the different instruments. How would you describe them to someone? Where do you hear them in the stereo field? And then when you go out to make music of your own, hopefully you'll have some good ideas of where to start.